Hello, yes, hello, it's hello, yes, hello. It's Joe here for Joyrider TV, back with some more QA on this delightful Friday afternoon. Uh, it's the afternoon here in Greece at the moment, where you are will probably be the morning, I should think, in one way or the other. So hello and thanks for joining me already. Um, yes, so what we are going to be looking at is just going through some questions that you are going to be asking. And I'm going to see if I can come up with a suitable answer. Hello to everybody who has already tuned in. Hello to Pigo. Hello to Tim Beecham in Clearwater, Red Tide, Florida. Hello to Charlie. Hi, Charlie. How are you doing? Hope it's all good in England. And hello, Nick. Everybody is tuning in. I, I haven't got so many preloaded questions today. So especially um, early in the session if you've got any questions i should fire them in pretty soon um because i've got plenty of time to give you a really good detailed response hello christian nice to have you on board hello scott dropping it in the slot with scott um yeah i hope you've been getting some good sailing there notching up those speed records i think scott might even be leading the solo Hobie 16s on the leaderboard. All right, so um, after this video is finished, it will be available to watch afterwards. Um, but of course, it's being filmed live. So um, that means if you are watching after it's uploaded, that means that I won't be able to respond to your questions at the time. I'll respond in the comments or um, in next week's video, but in the comments, certainly. Yeah. So uh, Nick says, how is the world's prep going? Yeah, I've been getting Bad Boy 94 out a few more times. When um, Nick came out on Bad Boy 94, we had a great sale. But then right at the end, one of the trapeze handles broke and actually cut Nick's hand. Uh, nasty stuff. Um, but since then, I've actually replaced all of the trapeze lines and handles if you did happen to see my, um, let's call it amateur splicing video, I did take that video down quite shortly after putting it up. But um, since then, I've redone all of the splices. And I think I now know how to do, I think it's called a locking Bremel splice. But I don't dare do another video for the amount of abuse that I'm going to get. Hi, Kush. How's it going? Good to have you on board. Yeah, yeah, I took it down pretty sharpish because what I didn't want was people to copy my technique and then have things like trapeze lines failing on them, which would have been poor. Let's say it would have been poor. Yeah, got out again with the tornado yesterday. So there will be a video uh, going out tomorrow evening, uh, for usual time. Uh, where it's just on the race course, race training course uh, with the tornado, which I think there's some good points in there uh, to take away from that. So that'll be tomorrow. But I think right now I'm going to just address my one preloaded question for this session. OK, so. This um, question comes from Jill. Who says any tips for removing the frame? Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, removing the frame from the hulls or pylons. One of four stuck, pounded with the rubber hammer, gave a one inch tried scissor jack, but hard to get it positioned right. OK, yeah, so I have got a very good technique, which does seem to work pretty well for getting the Hobie 16 apart if it is stuck. If you're not um, familiar with the Hobie 16 so much, you've got basically pylons, which are like these bits that stick out of the top of the hull. We got a detailed answer. Told you it was going to be detailed early on. So these pylons are like this. And then onto the pylon goes a casting. 
which is the same shape as you would expect, kind of like this, not to scale, of course. And, and that goes down onto there and then a bolt goes through. Now, what has been known to happen, especially if a boat's been together for quite a long time, is the corner casting. So that corner casting, if we go 3D now, would actually be, that one would be half of the rear beam expert illustrations as always and then the other hull would be here so there's the other pylon and the hull there like that yeah so if you don't put a lot of waterproof grease on your or some waterproof grease on your pylons when you're putting it together then they can stick and it does mean it's an issue when you're going to take it apart um the normal technique is using Thor's rubber hammer. We would take this and hit upwards after taking the bolt out, of course, go upwards up against the casting to knock it off the pylon, trying to keep them all even to some degree as we go round the boat. And usually that will come off. But in the event of it not coming off, what we would do is the full. I'm going to have to draw the picture again. Um, is I'd actually put the boat upside down. Hold on, which bit of the boat is that? All right, that's the hull. Kind of, yeah. This is good. All right, boat goes upside down. Here is. Here are the pylons. And let's say we've got one sticky casting here. And the casting's got a bit of shape to it, so you can hit it nicely. Then what I would do is under each end, I would put something that's going to keep all this off the floor. So I would take a simple wooden bench or a trestle and then just put a buoyancy aid on it or something to keep it from damaging the boat. And if necessary, the same at this end. But this end, if it was here, that end could just sit on the floor. That would be fine. And then what we're doing, going to get a tape measure out here so that we can proceed with some level of accuracy, um, is going to take a really, really big lump of wood, which is, what, what is it? It's about 15 centimetres square, so the top would be 15. And then the length of this bit of wood that we work, uh, that we use, which is very reliable, is let's say it's about 60 centimetres, maybe 50 centimetres long. Like this. Um, and then what I would then do is actually have the big lump of wood. You can use the big lump of wood a bit like a pile driver because it's going to have some weight. So you just lift it and hit the bottom of the casting with it. Boom. Do make sure your bolt is not in uh, before you start doing that, because if the bolt is in, problems might occur. So that would be stage one, to just hit the casting upside down like that with the big lump. Of course, spraying a bit of WD-40 in here could help as well, but it's the big lump, the power of the big lump the the sticky pylon does not stand a chance and then if having hit it with the big lump doesn't work then stage two this requires you to recruit a second person is we'd actually rest the big lump on the corner casting upside down so it's on there and then you get the biggest sledgehammer you can find and then hit onto the end of the big lump and nothing 
can stand in the way of that sort of power. If the sledgehammer has been forged in the eternal flame uh, by a dwarf, then I believe it's extremely powerful and that boat is definitely going to come apart. So there we go. That is the method that I would use. Another bit of method that I would use is before it comes to this, while the boat's the right way up, is if you've got two people, get one person on one of the bows, the other person on one of the sterns of the boat, at the back of the boat, and try just lifting up and pushing down against each other. So you're kind of twisting it, which might just break any kind of salty, gunky seal that is sticking the boat together. There we go. So, Joe, I hope that answers your question there. Um, it's pretty brutal, the big lump technique. But if your boat is absolutely stuck, that is a technique. All right. Big lump technique discussed. All right. Let's see what we've got in the live chat. So we've got Miguel, who's just hitting us in there with a question mark. Great to have you on board, Miguel. All right. Scott says, you mentioned in a video this week, rudder stall. What is it? What does it feel like? What does letting off the jib halley tension correct? What? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Why does the letting the rig tension off correct it? OK, so what rudder stall is is if we look at the back. All right, yeah, we're just looking at the rudder blade from the back. Um, and then this would be from the side. That's where the bolt goes through. There we go, that's the casting. So there's two ways that the rudder blade can move, which you don't want. Um, one... Uh, let's say the back of the boat is here for this one. Um, one is if the rudder blade is allowed to come this way from the back of the boat, so it's not all the way down into the stock, that is just going to give you heavy steering. It's going to mean it's a real fight to keep the boat going in a straight line or to steer. Now, we're looking straight on to the back of the rudder blade now, if that is allowed to go sideways like that, so if we've got play inside the rudder stock, if your bolt isn't tight enough, or if perhaps your rudder pin and the bushing isn't very good, then it will be allowed to go sideways. And it's that which will create what we're calling rudder stall. Rudder stall, will you'll usually feel that at higher speeds so usually I would say above 16 to 18 knots, that is when you might feel the rudder stall. And what it is, is as the rudder moves from side to side, you get a very turbulent flow on the rudder blade and you get pockets of air, which will be drawn like a cloud. Um, and you might get a big pocket of air on one side of the rudder blade and then water going past on the other side of the rudder blade. And what it feels like is, firstly, you'll feel like your rudders aren't working. And a lot of the time when the rudders stall, because of this extra load at the back of the boat, it really forces the bows of the boat down. And you feel that for some reason the boat just wants to go bows down the rudders have gone very unresponsive. What it also feels like is if you can imagine throwing a bucket on a rope off the back of the boat, what that would feel like for your boat speed, that is very much what rudder stall feels like. Um, sometimes your rudders might stall because you've got your mast too upright. Um, so... Uh, how shall we illustrate this? Are we still on here? Yes. All right. That's the hull. There's the rudder. If your mast is too upright, what that's doing is it's not putting enough 
kind of weight, enough pressure on the back of the boat, which means that this rudder stall will actually come a bit earlier and you'll definitely have that diving feeling. So what letting the rig tension off is going to do, it's going to allow the mast to drop back slightly, which is going to put a bit more weight and pressure over the back of the boat, which should, it should help to reduce the amount of rudder stall. But the thing that is going to help the rudder stall most is giving your rudders a good old tune up. Sometimes like in the videos, like last week when I was doing that video and I said, right, I'm going to let the rig tension off to see if that helps the steering. It's kind of like you can't exactly just service your rudders mid session. So you've got to try whatever you can and getting the rig tension absolutely in the sweet spot does make a lot of difference to the way that the boat feels. So that is what we're talking about with rudder stall, um, how it's created, why it happens, what it feels like, and how you can fix it. But also, if you get rudder stall, even if your rudders are set to lock down very easily, um, I think somebody's just given me $20. What is this? This is a new feature. I didn't know that was possible. Rule 32. Thank you very much. Very kind. That is very nice. Wow. I didn't know that was a thing, but it is. Wicked. Nice one. Um, yeah. So um, what was it? Yeah. If you get rudder stall, the other problem there is what it does is it puts so much load on the rudders that even if your rudders are set to lock down quite hard, like how we have our boats here, which are set to about 14 kilos of pressure at the tip before they'll come up, the rudders will come up, which if you're on a big speedy reach, you don't want the rudders coming up because that is a horrible feeling. Um, so there we go. I hope that helps, Scott. Um, set your rudders up nicely and you shouldn't feel it. If you don't, if you've never felt it, then two things. Uh, the first one would be that you're not sailing very fast, but I've seen your videos and your speeds on the stick. I know you're sailing fast enough to get a bit of rudder stall. But um, the second reason will be that the rudders need a service. So there we go. All right. Thanks very much for tuning in, everybody. Hope everybody's having a lovely day. Um, we did have a really cracking bit of champagne wind here in Vasiliki Bay today. Uh, I did get out briefly on a 16 and uh, it was nice. Okay, Miguel says, Hobie Europeans 2021. Um, unfortunately, I will not be attending the Hobie Europeans. Is it, when does it, it must be starting pretty soon. If anybody could say when that is starting, um, that would be great. Um, yeah, because... The Hobie Europeans are, of course, in Spain. Getting to Spain from Greece is quite a, a journey, but I suppose you could just drive to Athens, get on a plane. But um, apparently also at the Hobie Europeans, there has been a problem with the supply of charter boats. So I wouldn't have been able to go anyway. But um, I'll be interested to see that event as it unfolds. All right, we've got Bill on board. Hello, Bill. Uh, he says, got some small vertical cracks on the outside of both my Hobie 16 hulls, about one inch forward of the stern. Any advice? Is this due to unintentional abuse or just beaching with age? Yeah. Um, I would say that's probably beaching with age. Um, if you think about it, the back of the boat over time is going to be taking a lot of load. Like it's very close to where the rudders are. So if your rudders are getting a lot of pressure, that back section of the hull is equally going to be getting a lot of pressure. But there is a chance that um, those cracks are just cosmetic. So it could be that those cracks are just 
on the outer layer of gel coat. So the, um, if you're concerned about them, the way now that I'm fiberglass man here, so it seems what I would do, don't know what I'm going to draw, um, is I would just take a piece of sandpaper and just rub the middle of the, the crack just to see how deep it goes. And if it just, if after rubbing it, just taking the surface off, um, hopefully the crack will be gone, which means it was just a crack in the gel coat, um, which means you can then just fill it with some more gel coat. Easy. If it does go deeper, then maybe it is time to recruit the assistance of a boat builder to do a proper repair on that uh, where there's some reinforcement going on if necessary. But I wouldn't say it was due to un unintentional abuse or beaching. I think it's just Hobie 16s, if they're used a lot, they are going to have a lot of load going through um, going through the hulls, the rudders, everything. So after a while, they are going to start to show a show signs of um, what's it called? Where? All right. OK, we've got John on board. Having trouble getting back up the river in a hurricane 5.9. If the wind is blowing straight down the river, getting out of room before getting up any speed. Oh, my word. All right. This is a tricky one. So it's been a while since I've done this sort of stuff. But if we've got, let's say you've got the wind with the tide. So if we've got the wind there. Here's the river. And we've also got tide coming this way as well. Which means everything is pushing you back this way. And let's say you're trying to get to here. Hmm. Tricky. Yeah. So depending on how big the river is, I would be surprised if you if you're on the east coast of England sailing a, ho a hurricane 5.9. Um, but um, I used to sail on the east coast of England in some pretty tidal rivers. And what we would do is there would generally be from local knowledge and from speaking to other people and from sailing there for quite a long time, you'd know which side of the river or which area of the river would have less tide. So you want to be focusing your efforts in the weaker tidal stream. So if that was on this side, we'd basically be coming like this. We'd obviously be getting pushed back a little bit tack before you get into the really strong stuff get back and just short tack up here which is counterintuitive for a catamaran sailor but it is also really um good practice some good tacking and it is in this sort of situation this is what is going to make it essential that when you're tacking your boat you can get it up to speed quickly. So you really have to work on your tacking technique. And then you just have to decide when you're going to go across. So maybe it's up here and you'll go across, then the tide will push you down and you'll get to your end destination. Um, yeah, but you're running out of room before getting any speed up. Yeah. This is tri this sounds tricky. It, if, it, if the wind is really light and you're trying to get back to your point of origin, then that might be the time, unfortunately, to have to get a paddle out and use a bit of alternative propulsion as well. Um, without seeing a bit more, seeing some video of this would be really good because then um, we'll be able to see some video of this, but also... Uh, we might be able to give you some more advice on that, John. Uh, maybe. All right. Bill, with the cracks in the hull, says, how much water do you usually drain from the hulls after sailing? And how do you get it out? Seems like I have to almost stand a boat up ver vertically to get the water out due to the curve. Um, 
Yeah, so it's not just related to the curve on the 16. What it's also related to is it's the fact that the holes are quite small. So as the water is coming out, what it's doing is it's creating a vacuum. Uh, like the water coming out is kind of like almost sucking the sides of the holes in. Not very much, of course, but and kind of like if you take a glass, uh, what would you take? Like a glass of water and have it underwater and then you pull it up in like um, the sink or something and the water doesn't come out because you've got that. Uh, is it a vacuum? You've got something going on anyway. Or if you push an empty glass down into the water, it will you'll have an air pocket in there. The same kind of thing is happening with the 16 when you're draining it. Um, the best thing to help you draining a 16 is to get some sort of tube. I'm not sure. Um, I couldn't say what diameter of tube is best, but get some tube and feed it up about halfway up the hull. So it's definitely not in the water. And then put your boat on quite an angle like you're doing anyway. And then what that tube is doing is it's allowing air to pass into the hull, which is going to prevent there from being that vacuum stopping the water coming out. But yes, to get it all out, you do need to get the boat on a fair old angle. And the boats that are worse are actually the boats with the skeg hull. Because if you've got a skeg hull, pretty nasty hull shape there, you're going to get water collecting here unless you get to a certain angle. So um, getting the bow of the boat really high. If you've got a hill available or where you bring the boat out of the water, there's going to be some sort of slope. If you can drain the boat there, that is really going to help you out as well to get a bit more angle. The water's going to come out a bit quicker. What is the normal amount? I would say uh i don't know uh maybe a pint a bit less than a liter of water seems pretty normal around here of course the ideal is to have no water coming uh getting into your holes at all um but the boats do take water in one thing i've noticed here um over the years is a lot of the time you think the boat's been leaking a lot but it might be because it wasn't drained um entirely the time before and then like you say bill that could be related to question one where you've got these cracks there could be water getting in here in there but like i've said before one place which is quite overlooked um as a source of where water could get in is if your bungs haven't got good seals check the quality of your bungs, because if perhaps you sail on a sandy beach and the bungs have occasionally been put in with a bit of sand on there, that sand might have been wearing away at, let's get a bung. We're getting a bung. Um, okay, I've got a bung. All right, so that sand might be what might have been wearing away at the thread of the bung, which over time is going to leave a bit of a gap in there. And then if you're, um, you should have a rubber seal on your bung like this. If your rubber seal is slightly tarnished, um, then that is going to be another source where the boat could leak. So um, it's the easiest thing to check. And a lot of the time, it is actually the source of the problems. So uh, do check your bungs first. Another one and potential leaking point, and I say this because I know we had it on one of our boats this week, was uh, we're back on the pylons, top of the hull, pylon, pylon, and the hull kind of goes up and then round and then down where the pylon meets the hull. Um, just check um, that 
around here is really well sealed. If it looks like the sealant has started flaking off there, it should have a bead of sealant running all the way around it. If that's not there, uh, we did notice when our sealant had started flaking a bit, uh, the boat was leaking a lot more. So check that out as well. OK, we've got Arno on board who says, good morning. I am guessing, Arno, you must be in either the US or Canada. Uh, but good morning. It's got a 1980 Hobie 16. The tramp frame is out of square by about 10 centimetres. When comparing distances from opposite corners. Crikey. Um, hmm. That's a tricky one. Um, yeah. What would you do? The only thing you can... Um, yeah, I've, I'm actually a little bit stumped there, Arno, to be honest. Um, so what you've got is the frame of the trampoline. And when you're taking a measurement from here to here, you've got one distance. And from here to here, you've got minus 10. Yet, yeah. which means it's a bit out. Unfortunately, I really can't think what you'd do about that. If anybody's got any ideas, just put it in the live chat. Um, because as it stands, I am a little bit stumped. What I'll do is I'll put this to my science department here um, on the team at Wildwind. We've got quite a lot of very clever people working who are university students and some of them are kind of science based and they love this sort of it's like a puzzle um yeah unfortunately i am absolutely stumped uh but well yeah so sorry i can't help you there arno uh moving on all right we've got rodrigo who says Hi, Joe. Which watches did you recommend to regatta races? Some time ago, you mentioned Timex one. Does it have a 5410 minutes timer? Now, um, what I've used for probably the last, I don't know, 30 years now, I reckon, is the Timex Ironman Triathlon. Um, the, the reason that I've, keep, I've kept using these is because I've kept using these. And you know, when you're really familiar with how something works and it's never let you down, um, it just gives you a good reason to keep using it. And the, uh, the Timex Ironman triathlon watches come in at about 35, 40 pounds. Um, you can get them from a lot of places and they're, it just they just do me fine. Um, the countdown timer doesn't do a 5410. It just does a you set the timer, set it running, and you can have it so it's either going round. So when it expires, it will start again, or you can have it so when it expires, it starts a stopwatch, which is what I find the most useful feature there. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a, a brilliant timepiece, and like those. There are other ones out there, but they do tend to be very expensive uh, to get a similar quality to the Timex. So I'm very happy with the Timex. Durable as well. I've never had one break. Um, I've had a few fall off, straps breaking, that kind of thing. Uh, but that is all. All right, we've got Finn Time Lapse on board. He says it's 12.45 in the night here in Australia. Good to have you on board, Finn Time Lapse. All right. Then we've got Russell dialed N-07, who says he did 60 miles on the NACRA Inter 20 this weekend. Great sailing. The Windward Leeward course. All right, we're going to do a quick conversion. 21.9 MPH. In not 19.03. 
top speed. That's pretty good. Um, send me the details. We'll put that on the speed stick, Russell. Um, 19 knots. That's juicy, especially when you're doing a windward leeward course. Um, very nice. Okay, we've got Ignore This on board, who says, Wee! And then many shapes. Thanks for tuning in. Ignore This. Okay. All right. Scott says, uh, Scott was talking about the rudder stall. He says it will service his rudders this winter. I think it's always a good idea to service your rudders because the, especially if you're looking at doing some sailing in stronger winds, just having that reliability of having good steering is so essential. Um, if you're going out when it's windy and you're not really confident about your ability to control the boat with the rudders, you've already got some sort of um, psychological uh, blocker stopping you from going out there and doing what you want to do. So, yes, get them serviced. All right, we've got rule, rule 32. Hello from the US missile field. Your videos inspired me to start sailing again. The question I have is, have you ever fallen off your boat and it kept sailing away from you? How would you handle the situation? Oh, my golly gosh. Yes. Um, short answer. No, I haven't fallen off the boat and the boat has just left me behind. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but um, earlier on in the summer, I did a whole series of videos about what happens if you fall off your boat in different kind of um, scenarios and what we discovered was the worst scenario for falling off your boat, if you're not holding on, is in the lighter wind, if you're sailing on a downwind course, so the mainsail and the traveller is like really far out, um, and you fall off the boat, because the mainsail and the traveller is far out, it means the, the main isn't going to turn the boat into wind as much. So... Um, We'll just mention this about here's the boat. If we've got pressure in the main sheet, um, then the boat is always naturally to some degree going to turn up into the wind and eventually it will stop. But if the mainsail is out, so if you're sailing downwind in a light wind, you're not getting that pressure, which is going to, the mainsail might catch a little bit and the boat might turn a little bit into the wind. But um, it's, there it is, there's the Timex. Um, but it's just going to keep going. So that is the most difficult and dangerous time to be out sailing for falling off is in the lighter winds because the boat is not going to stop. It's going to keep going if you're sailing downwind. From the testing, what we found was in the stronger wind, if you fall off the boat, there's no one on the boat. The boat is going to capsize almost immediately, regardless of what you've, of how you've got the boat set up or anything. So that means that as long as you're reasonably good at swimming, you should be able to get back to the boat um, eventually or the capsized boat, of course, isn't going to be sailing away from you quite as quickly. Um, but the best thing you can do is to always have a hand on the main sheet. It's the main sheet that's going to stop you from capsizing. Um, and it's your lifeline on the boat. So if you do fall off the boat, you've got a hold of the main sheet. If it's light wind, you're holding the main sheet. The boat will just head up into the wind and stop. If it's strong wind, you're holding the main sheet. <laughs> You're going to have to grab it pretty hard, but it's going to sheet in and the boat is going to capsize once again, meaning that you can get back to the boat easily. There you go. Uh, so I hope that helps. Um, but if the boat did just sail away from you indefinitely, like in that light wind situation, then, um, yeah, it's another good point for always carry a whistle with you for attracting the attention of other water users 
or perhaps people from the shore uh, to help you. Otherwise, maybe you've got a long swim on your hands. All right. Scott says, better for EPO threes. All right. OK. And rule 32 says always. Also, please check out my channel, which is called Rule 32. Tell me what you think. All right. Will do. Um, OK. All right. We've got Russell from the science department about this wonky Hobie frame. And Russell says the frame is not square. So the beams may be not sliding all the way up into the castings. Ensure there is no buildup or debris in the castings to make sure they're sliding all the way in on all four, four corners. All right, Tim in Florida has also got something on this um, on this topic. He says, with that 10 centimetres difference, consider drilling out the stainless steel rivets on the corner castings and cross beams, realign and then replace with new rivets. All right, Jazz says, on the same topic, all right, we're all over this topic now. This is great. This is what the community can do. Um, what about hitting the longer side with 10 centimetres with a hide hammer? It might move the frame square. Scott says, remove the pylon bolts, square up the frame, re-drill new holes through the pylons, reset the bolts. You have to shorten your pylons or raise them so you're not elongating the previous pylon holes holes i would say that one's a little bit juicier i think um russell and tim are winning there with the make check for for stuff building up in your castings and replace your rivets to try to get rid of that wonkiness that wonk all right we've got jake oddmonic it says, good morning. I've been out sailing the past two weeks. Need to catch up on episodes. Getting better at the Hobie 16. Great stuff. Fantastic. Glad to hear it. Oh, we've got Paul, Bow Wave Paul on board, who uses the Optimum Time Race Watch. It does it all. Sounds like a good piece. It does the ISAF start sequence pre-programmed. Okay. In fact, I think at this juncture, I'm just going to take short commercial break because I need a drink. Um, thanks for coming, everyone, by the way. All right, we've got Domagoj Rebic, who says, I sail Grabna Evo inflator bike inflatable oh inflatable catamaran nice yeah i'm still waiting to get that golden ticket from mini cat to send me one of their boats particularly keen on getting either the mini cat 420 out here or the mini cat guppy because i think the guppy is the smallest in the range and i think the smallest one really deserves to be tested in the Vasiliki champagne sailing conditions. So what is my opinion on inflatable cap catamarans, just to go on to this? Um, my opinion is I think they're an absolutely great idea for people who are either, maybe you don't have so much space, perhaps you're going, you don't get out quite as frequently and it is something you could have in your car. So. Um, just so, really, really practical. I saw uh, one of the guys that we featured in Show Us Your Cat. I think he was living in Paris. He had no space at all to store a boat. So he had an inflatable catamaran. When he finished sailing, he'd deflate it and he'd store it under his bed. What? Storing your boat under your bed. What a great reason to have an inflatable boat. But if it means you can get out onto the water, then I'm all for it. But what I want is to get one here so I can try it out, and test it for myself. That is also my opinion. All right, Arno, 
This is Arno with the non-square um, frame says, thanks very much. I will try a few of the suggestions. I may try ratchet straps to square it up and then tighten the tramp. I'll let you know how it goes in the spring. Yeah. Also a worthy um, thing to try there, I think. All right. So Tim's getting in on Bill's question. Cracks on the sides of the transoms usually mean water is leaking into the transoms and causing the wood to swell and the aluminium plate to corrode to prevent put silicon caulk on the rudder bolts. OK, we're getting some good contributions here to help everybody with their problems. All right, we've got Carl Phillip. Who says, can you try sailing the 49er one day? Yes, when I get the time. Um, I will do that. But uh, time at the moment is pretty precious. So um, I'll just say at this point, is has anybody got any more questions? Because otherwise, that is as far as we're taking it this week. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks to everybody for um, their continued support of Joyrider TV. Um, oh, we've got Thomas. Can you try sailing the Laser Vago or Pico? Um, we don't actually have a Vago or a Pico here. We have had both of those types of boats here in the past. But um, what we have at the moment in the fleet of boats, which I like to call Formula Plastic, is we've got the RS Zest which is really good. It does the same job as the Pico, but it's a, mo a much more modern design and it's a lot more spacious. The problem that the Pico had was for an adult sailing the Pico, it was too uh, cramped, not enough space on the boat. It was like your knees would be round your ears a bit if you were fairly tall, so not very comfortable. Whereas the more modern plastic single-handed boats have got a lot more space. They've all realised this was a problem. Let's make the boat so it's more appealing to a wider audience. So we use the Zest, which is the most modern one. Uh, I did do a review video on that. Great fun. Uh, we also use the Cuba from RS, which is the one before that, which is also a very good boat, but not quite as user friendly. The Zest also has a pivoting centreboard in German. That is Schwenkschwerther. Um, yeah, and the pivoting centreboard means you haven't got this massive bit of daggerboard in the way on the boat. Um, yeah, and then the Vago. We did have a Vago, but it, we had one of the earlier Vagos. I think it was a prototype, and it kind of just over time, it kind of flopped with the heat. It kind of melted a bit. Uh, Vago was actually quite a difficult boat to sail. A lot more difficult than um, the RS500 that we use here now. There you go. All right, Jim Jum. I wish we had more catamaran interest on the west coast of the US. We have the F18 America's Championships this weekend at Long Beach, Los Alimot Alimotos Bay Yacht Club. Hope it turns some people on. I hope so too. I would, you know, if I could be there, I would come over and sail any type of F-18. Right, Bullfrush. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much to you also. And Domagoj says, uh, say hi to my dear Vasiliki. Will do. All right, Jim Jum says, fantastic job. Love the chat sessions. Okay, so there we go. That is all we've got this week. Um, all right, toots tooted in, howdy. Great. Okay, and we've got, um, I believe this text is Russian, which I can't read, I'm afraid. Um, but it said, Joy, a great work, man. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll see you next week with more Q&A. I've got this tornado video tomorrow. Thanks, Rule 32, for your contribution. I don't even know how you did that, but thank you very much. Um, if anybody else fancies tucking a bit in the old doodah, then that would be very nice also. 
Okay, thanks, Nick. Thanks for tuning in. And I'll see you next week with more of this. Tomorrow, we've got the tornado around the track. On Sunday, we've got Show Us Your Cat. Yes, um, very exciting. We've got a major refurb on there and uh, cover not coverage, but some um, stuff about the British Hobie 16 Nationals, which just finished. And uh, Super Chats all around. That's what it is, Super Chat. That's how Rule 32 did it. Um, yeah, check out Super Chats on YouTube for next time. Okay, thanks very much. I'll see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV, of course.